LLS. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. Tonight's forum will consider a subject of great importance to democracy and global politics, and I think to the making of U.S. foreign policy. The IOP is fortunate to co-sponsor tonight's event, Hong Kong in Crisis, the or Origins and Implications, with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance, and innovation, and the Harvard Hong Kong Society. We are grateful to have Professor Anthony Sage as our moderator, and I will ask him to introduce our panelists after I tell you a little bit about him. Professor Sage is a leading internationalist, scholar, and expert on China who oversees an array of global works and projects of such great range and impact that it is hard in a short space to convey all that he does. But let me try this evening. As director of the Ash Center, Professor Sage oversees the Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia and also serves as faculty chair of the China Public Policy Program, the Asia Energy Leaders Program, and the Leadership Transformation in Indonesia Program, all offering training projects to national and local Chinese officials. He is also the Daywood Professor of International Affairs here at Harvard Kennedy School. He advises, he advises government, private, and nonprofit organizations that work in China and Asia. Here at Harvard, he sits on the executive committee of the John King Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies and the Asia Center. He is also Harvard's representative to the Kennedy Memorial Trust, which provides scholarships to UK students for graduate studies at Harvard and MIT. We are very grateful that you are here tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for that uh, generous uh, introduction. First of all, uh, thank you everybody for attending uh, this evening. It's clearly a very important topic. What I'd like to do is first make some general comments by way of introduction and then pose some questions to uh, our panelists and then we will discuss some of those issues and then open it up to uh, questions from the floor which is the normal uh, practice. So just uh, briefly, uh, by way of introduction, the long-term uh, background to this is that uh, when sovereignty was granted uh, to China from July 1st, 1997, it was under the principle of one country, two systems. That, of course, was unclear uh, what that would really meant, but in principle, Hong Kong's economic and social system was to be continued for 50 years. The details, in as far as they exist, were then enunciated in the Basic Law, which was formally adopted by the National People's Congress on the 4th of April, 1990. However, I think the role of Hong Kong's right to interpret and amend the Basic Law was ambiguous, at least. And uh, powers were vested in the National People's Congress and its standing committee uh, to oversee those aspects. But of course, the key turning point and what has brought us here together this evening is what began to happen from June uh, this year when the State Council Information Office uh, in China released a white paper to correct what it termed were misunderstandings about one country, two systems. And it said in that report, and I quote, the high degree of autonomy is not full autonomy, nor a decentralized power, it is the power to run local affairs as authorized by the central leadership. And it seems to me that is important for the discussion that we have this evening. This was made even more clear in September when the National People's Congress announced its decision concerning universal suffrage for the election of the chief executive in 2017. As we know and has been reported uh, in the press, press the candidates would be selected uh, through a small group, not the population of Hong Kong as a whole. And then the demonstration started. We've just got to the end of almost two months of demonstrations. There have been discussions between the Hong Kong government and uh, representatives uh, of the protests. The government offered to submit a report to Beijing. 
There was talk of maybe a referendum uh, amongst uh, people in Hong Kong, which has been postponed. Uh, some have even called for direct talks with Beijing. Uh, so that brings us to this evening. So where are we at the current moment? And what are the possible options for the future? And it seems to me a set of questions arise related to that, and we're very lucky to have panelists who can speak to those issues. First of all, what is the actual legal status amid this set of complexities? Are people really talking on the basis of actual uh, legal precedent? Is there clear laws laid down by this, and how can one interpret it? Also, it's interesting in that context, I think, to understand clearly how is that nominating committee put together? Because I think there's also a misunderstanding about that. Secondly, a key issue is, will Beijing budge? Uh, my view is no. I don't think it will. Already we see a, a very traditional response from Beijing, blaming it on a small number of troublemakers, uh, claiming that there's foreign involvement, uh, which is stirring up troubles within Hong Kong, which is the normal uh, response from the Chinese Communist Party to when there's unrest or when there are problems or demonstrations. Does it actually matter to Beijing? How important is this to Beijing? And then thirdly, as we enter the second month of this, what can the protesters do now? What are their actual objectives? As I said, we have three experts here who can help us deal with these questions and others uh, that they arise. We have to Mr. C.M. Chen, who is currently a mid-career student here at the Hong Kong Kennedy School. He's a legal counsel in Hong Kong and also a member of the Hong Kong uh, Society of Lawyers. Uh, here we have uh, Professor Kirby, who is a university a distinguished service professor, uh, has a wide-ranging knowledge of history throughout East Asia, teaches both at FAS and also at HBS. And also we have with us Heather Pickerel, who is uh, due to graduate from the college in 2015, uh, deeply knowledgeable about Hong Kong, quite aware of what has been discussed uh, by the protesters. But let me turn first uh, to Mr. Chen, because I think one of the key questions is trying to understand what the legal basis is here, and what is the principle on which this nominating committee is put together. CM? Thank you, Professor Sage. Um, I would like perhaps to start with uh, the very beginning, uh, when Hong Kong was returned to China um, in 1997, it was actually based on the joint declaration between the uh, government of the Great Britain and China, which was signed in 1984. Um, it's a very uh, long, extensive uh, uh, international treaty, which is actually registered at the United Nations. Um, the most relevant uh, section of that uh, declaration is, uh, to, for tonight's purposes, is about the chief executive. Um, when British government and the Chinese government, they agree that when China, uh, Hong Kong is to be returned, the chief executive uh, will be chosen in the following way, very broad terms, either by, uh, it should be nominated by the central people's government on the results of either election or consultations. So in other words, the British actually not uh, did not promise that there will be universal suffrage in Hong Kong after 1997. So this is the starting off point I, want, I would like to make. And like uh, Professor Sage said, in 1990, the basic law, which is Hong Kong's mini constitution, was promulgated. In the basic law, Article 45 actually elaborated a little bit. It sort of recited the terms of the joint declaration. And then it goes on to say that, yes, Hong Kong, you can have universal suffrage uh, in an orderly manner. And, and also in accordance with the actual situation of Hong Kong. Um, the ultimate aim is universal suffrage, but there will be a nominating committee to pre-select the candidates before the public can vote. So it's actually written very clearly in the Constitution. So uh, I'll, I'll, we will talk about more about the, uh, the composition of this nominating com committee in a minute. But just by way of uh, legal updates, um, the uh, protesters are still on the streets as we speak. And uh, there are actually two injunctions taken out last week against all these protesters. Um, and the uh, Hong Kong Bar Association and the Hong Kong Law Society both issued statements condemning those uh, 
encouraging people to disobey the injunction, which is granted by a independent judiciary. This is actually quite damaging to the Hong Kong rule of law. So um, you know, just, just by way of update uh, on this of issues, because many people are actually affected in Hong Kong economically, but as a lawyer, I'm a bit worried about the uh, encroachment on the rule of law, which is the backbone cornerstone of Hong Kong's uh, success. Certainly that's something that always has been pointed out as being one of the keystones of, of life in Hong Kong. And as a number of people would say that, you know, even under the British, you know, Hong Kong had all the trappings of democracy without the actual elections, the rule of law, free press, so on and so forth. Heather, I just want to turn to you, given one thing that CM uh, mentioned there, and that is that this was never promised. So why, why are the people protesting? They're protesting about something that was never promised to them, and yet it seems to be giving the impression that Beijing has somehow moved back from a promise it has made. Um, from my personal experience, I think people in my generation feel a certain sense of frustration um, with everything that's going on in Hong Kong. You know, the first thing I actually remember was watching the handover on television, and it was a moment of great promise for our city. You know, we were we returned to the mainland, and Hong Kong was on a great path. You said it yourself. Hong Kong has all the trappings of a democratic country without the process of elections. And I could say pretty much until this year, I think many people my age actually didn't really have an opinion on the subject. I myself was neutral on the subject of democracy. And it wasn't really until this summer when the white paper was passed and the Chinese government decided that it would have a nominating committee. And then, of course, we all saw pictures of the tear gas on the streets and the pepper spray. And I think that was a key turning point for many people. A lot of people don't realize that the Occupy movement actually was a pretty small portion of society that didn't really have general consensus or backing. And I think this year was truly the turning point for a lot of young people in Hong Kong especially. I saw yesterday in a Chinese university report, 78% of Hong Kongers under the age of 30 now support the democracy movement. Mm. That definitely wasn't true even four or five months ago. So how much then, Heather, do you think this is really, I mean, I understand there's a catalyst which has set this off, but how much, and you seem to imply this in your comment, that it really was an outpouring of other frustrations that were building up amongst people in Hong Kong as, as they observed this process of one country, two systems developing? Is that a fair statement? Yes, I think it is a fair statement. There's a lot of you know, underlying demographic and socioeconomic tensions that are emerging in Hong Kong. Um, whether it's political corruption has been a topic of discussion. Social inequality, Hong Kong has the most unequal society in the world when it comes to socioeconomics. Uh, those two especially are topics that are constantly under discussion in Hong Kong. Also, political freedoms has, has been a long topic of discussion since the handover. I remember when I was, what, nine or 10, when nearly a million Hong Kongers took to the street to protest against Article 23, mm -hmm. the largest protest of its kind in Asia ever. So, you know, these things have been longstanding issues, and I think they finally come to a helm now. Mm. That's interesting. Bill, I, I just wanted to turn to you for a minute, because obviously, what is behind all this is Beijing's attitude. And uh, you've studied uh, extensively uh, Chinese history over a long period of time. And I suppose I, I have two, two different questions for you. The first is, um, how is this being seen in Beijing? And secondly, I know you've recently been in Taiwan. What is, the, is this having any effect on the way Taiwan is thinking about potential future reunification with the mainland? Well, I'm just back from Beijing, and the if you're watching TV, it isn't being seen <laughs> in Beijing. The screen goes, oops, it goes uh, blank. And, uh, but of course, it is being watched very carefully by the, by the leadership in Beijing. You know, if you look at it historically, it's a very interesting story. In some sense, uh, Hong Kong's return to the mainland almost surely would have happened much earlier mm -hmm. uh, had there not been a communist revolution or had they not won. Chiang Kai-shek would have taken this back about 1955, 1956. So one could say that the communists saved Hong Kong for capitalism, for the British, for some period of time because it was quite useful to them mm -hmm. uh, at, at a moment in time. That's not- Unless of course Chiang Kai-shek had allowed capitalism to flourish in Hong Kong and then- That's he might or might not have. Uh, that's all. Uh, but as, if we look at the, if you, I think what Heather talked about is very interesting. The fuse for this was lit in a, several incidents in recent years, the one that Heather just referred to, but also two years ago, I believe, and it's this Guomin Jiao Yu, the idea of a patriotic education. education coming from the mainland 
using mainland textbooks or textbooks based on mainland textbooks to make Hong Kong Chinese more patriotic, more you know, learning party history and so mm -hmm. on. And there was an enormous upsurge in the universities and in the high schools against this. Why did this happen? First of all, my sense is that uh, Beijing did not want an incident on this. Uh, and the Hong Kong government, perhaps trying too hard to please Beijing, mm. pushed this very hard and came up against a very large backlash by people who are now educated in a great university system in Hong Kong where there is full freedom of expression. Almost all who are in Hong Kong universities today are the first person in their family to go to universities. So you have a highly literate and upwardly mobile youth that have different aspirations from their families. And that gets me to kind of a big point, or I think it's an important point about the one country, two systems. Of those two systems, one of them more, is more or less the same as it was when this principle was announced right. or articulated. In many ways, it's become more authoritarian that is the PRC system since 1984. But Hong Kong has changed dramatically, as Taiwan has. So it's a formula that doesn't allow for the flexibility easily of the second system. And yet Hong Kong has evolved uh, in a matter in which, in many ways, there's a more open discussion of public issues. There's more democracy today than there was uh, in, even in the last years of British rule. But it's half, it's one country, two systems has something that's half-baked. Uh, that is to say, only one side of it, it's, is it clear what it is. Mm. And so you have a chief executive, no matter who it is, it's structural, a chief executive who has authority but very little legitimacy because of the way he's selected. You have a legislature that has legitimacy because it's elected in part, but virtually no authority except to block things. And then third, you have a, a superb permanent bureaucracy and legal system uh, that w is really the envy of the world, but it has no political base. Mm. And so I think, I think you're seeing a, a, a political system in transition, but to what is unclear. Uh, and it's a very difficult system to make work even in and of itself, let alone vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a, a larger and at the moment impatient mainland. Then what are the implications for Taiwan, which has changed dramatically since the one country's two systems uh, principle was enunciated by Deng Xiaoping and is now a full-fledged democracy. I was with our Harvard Law School graduate, President Ma, uh, in a meeting with him last week uh, in, in Taipei, and he had just given in his double ten speech, that is to say the National Day speech mm -hmm. of the Republic of China, uh, the idea, quoting or playing on a quote from Deng Xiaoping that, who once said famously that some parts of China should get rich first and he said, well, maybe some parts of China, greater China, should have <laughs> democracy first. Uh, if I remember the phrase, uh, for which he got a very unpleasant response <laughs> um, from our friends. <laughs> so this, the idea of one China, two, you know, one country, two systems, the idea of one country may be stable, but the systems themselves are not. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think one thing that, that struck me from both, Heather, something you mentioned and something Bill alluded to, if I was Xi Jinping, I would be furious at the moment. At whom? At whoever advises him from Hong Kong. Mm. He must have had such poor advice, yes. both from the Hong Kong <coughs> government, but presumably from his own offices in the uh, liaison office, the Communist Party offices, that must, and whether it's just because he talks to a certain elite within Hong Kong, it seems to me that Beijing was very ill-informed. I, I think all of us were ill-informed. I, I mean, I was taken aback that this particular set of demonstrations broke out. I mean, if I had been sitting in Zhongnanhai, which is the headquarters for the Communist Party, you know, I wouldn't have known how to respond. So I, I think he probably has had very poor intelligence, and it's really put them on the back foot. But CM, I, I, I wanted to come back to, to one of the other issues with you. And, because I think one of the really crucial issues this hinges on is this nominating committee. And it seems to me, if there is a way forward, that is perhaps one of the only areas where there may be a foot. If Beijing's not going to say, yeah, you can have open uh, elections for the candidates. So I think it's important to understand how is this nominating committee put together at the moment? I, I, I think, uh, Tony, you're absolutely right. Um, the Hong Kong government actually issued a consultation paper last year um, asking for opinions how this committee should 
be made up. Unfortunately, the whole focus now turned to Occupy. Right. So people actually forgot about, you know, the most important point is actually get this committee as dem democratically represented as possible. So uh, on the one hand, one extreme, the pro-democracy camp people say that this nominating committee itself should be one people, one vote, should be, you know, uh, universal suffrage on this committee. I don't think uh, Beijing will allow that. Right. However, on the other hand, on the other spectrum, um, the government seems to be proposing there should be made up of four different sectors, basically similar to the functional constituencies uh, of the uh, LegCo, which is the legislative, uh, legislature of Hong Kong, should be elected. So basically it's made up of professionals, uh, businessmen, you know, you know uh, uh, people like that. So there's actually a big spectrum between that and less get down to business, talk about this uh, committee. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we actually haven't started the process mm -hmm. yet. It's still in consultation. Yeah. Heather, if we look forward from the protesters' perspective, is this maybe a, a more sensible area to focus on? Or, you know, from the people you know in Hong Kong, where do you see this going now after two months? So I agree that it's probably the most sensible um, way out of this is to focus on the nominating committee. There's only so many concessions that you can get from the Chinese government, which in my personal opinion, and it looks like in yours, probably won't concede anything at all. Um, but the thing is, what people don't really truly understand here is that the movement for democracy is actually very split up. It's, it's a very nebulous blob that involves lawyers, uh, politicians from the pan-democratic camp, uh, students, the Occupy movement, and they all disagree on what the solution for a better democracy in Hong Kong is. And you can see that with the most recent announce, announce that they were going to have a vote, a referendum on the government's mm -hmm. suggestions, and then they canceled it. And I think that shows the divisions within the democracy camp. So while it's my personal opinion and the personal opinion of many of my friends in Hong Kong, that focusing on getting a democratically, demographically, socioeconomically representative nominating committee is probably the best way to go. A lot of people in Hong Kong do think that the chief executive should just be one person, one vote, and that's it. Mm. So you think there should be more democratic centralism in the movement? I mean, I think... Among the students. Among the students, I mean, yeah. that's the thing. It's not so much amongst the students, but it's really, I, it looks like it's students versus the Occupy movement. They don't mm. seem to look eye to eye on a lot of things, even the location of the protests or, you know, what the color should be. Even, all these things are really disparate. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, th th this is not an unusual phenomenon when you have a grassroots movement that comes up. And it, I think it's often uh, one of the problems that, because it tries so desperately to be inclusive, it tries so hard to be different from what is there before. I mean, it tries to consult extensively. Um, I mean, I saw this, you know, back in 1989. I was on the Tiananmen Square most days. And you could see that there were different groups with different agendas, and no one wanted to impose an agenda on anyone else. And, and part of the end result was, who do you negotiate with, under what circumstances, and what do they really want? And uh, I suppose, you know, one could, you seem to be making the argument that the, you know, the divisions within the group in Hong Kong uh, makes it difficult for them to come to a consensus for themselves. Absolutely. Does it strike you that there's also one dimension to this that I think is very difficult to study and to understand, but it's a cultural dimension mm -hmm. uh, that we're now, you know, X number of years since 1997. Uh, the mainland presence in Hong Kong is much greater yeah. uh, in terms of mainlanders, successful mainlanders who have moved for excellent reasons to Hong Kong, which is a wonderful place to live and to bring up children. Uh, real estate, of course, um, putting pressure on real estate. But it also the cultural dimension of everyone now learning Putonghua. Yeah. Uh, everyone Standard now... Chinese. Uh, finding alternative career paths, possibly in the mainland or not, kind of a denigration, just linguistically, of Cantonese and others, which is a much more ancient, and at least in poetry, more distinguished language mm -hmm. uh, than Mandarin. And it reminds me a little bit, happily it's not this tragic, of the tensions immediately in Taiwan after post-unification in 1945, uh. 46, 47, where people were told, suddenly you will speak Mandarin, suddenly you will learn San Min Jui. Mm. So there's a cultural dimension to the 228 movement also, that ha or that incident, uh, that uh, is so really- So can you say a little bit what the 228 is? Uh, that is to say sure an uprising is. against nationalist rule yeah. in the unification, in that moment after what one can think of as the first, who knows if it will be the only reunification of Taiwan with the mainland. The other thing is that I think it's a 
a tension that has to be, and perhaps Tony, you could talk about this. There, you have in the People's Republic a, a sense that what we have in Hong Kong maybe is another form of a color revolution. Uh, and yet there's a color revolution going on right now in Beijing too, it's called red. Mm -hmm. um, that is a, a kind of an almost, at least from many perspectives, uh, some aspects of neo-Maoist rhetoric uh, at the highest positions of, of leadership that cannot uh, be gauged to make this problem uh, uh, easier to solve. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things I've noticed in Hong Kong is that there's different responses to the mainlanders coming in. In part, yes, there's a new elite clearly coming in. But then you see other reports in the press, uh, which, you know, coming from England, I remember when, you know, people were coming from Eastern Europe, you know, they're taking some of our jobs, they're the plumbers, they're the this, they're the that. They're using our welfare state. And so you've seen some of these tensions reflected within Hong Kong about, well, they're coming down to deliver their babies here, you know, using our welfare facilities. Is this play into it at all, Heather, this sort of, you know, the friction the bill is talking about accommodating different cultures? So I can't deny that the friction between Hong Kongers and mainlanders is, you know, funnels some of the fuel. Uh, that being said, I think it is important for people to understand that the protests are not an anti-mainland protest, I, mm. and they're not for anti-mainlander protest. Also, the cultural uh, differences between, you know, Polish plumbers versus the mainlanders coming in is that I think a lot of Hong Kongers do feel a sense of existential threat. You know, there are, there, you know, mainlanders from all classes um, and all kinds of terrible stereotyping. You know, it's really not okay, and Hong Kongers really do need to be better about the way we talk about mainlanders and the way that we treat them. That is definitely true. But I think the sense of existential threat just makes things a little bit, you know, scarier. I saw that in the last Hong Kong government report, 40 million mainlanders move through Hong Kong every year. Oof. That's a city of 7 million yeah. residents, and that's four zero million. So you can see why people get a little bit on edge about it. Sure. I'm sorry if there are any Polish plumbers in the audience. <laughs> I don't mean to offend you, but... Uh, um, yes, I think the other thing is that the direction that, that Beijing is moving certainly wouldn't uh, lead to uh, wishes to, you know, accommodate what the protesters are talking about. I mean, I think... We're seeing with uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping, a very confident leader, someone who clearly feels that, you know, this is his right to rule this, is actually proud of his history, um, has revived certain aspects of it. It's not just the red culture, as you know, he's reviving um, study uh, also of Chinese classics. Great. And so I think there is there, I think, a deeper search also going on in Beijing about you know, how to provide legitimacy, how to draw lines of continuity with the past. And I think for, for Xi Jinping, this is just an irritating interruption. You know, when he wants to get on with other business, suddenly this is sort of, you know, taking up time in Politburo meetings so and others. The question then is, if one looks at, I think, talking about the opportunities that Beijing has, uh, an opportunity really for statesmanship and leadership yeah. to take the opportunity, not not to make a massive, and this won't happen, I agree with you, a large public concession, but to take at the proper moment a step back and reconsider what is the makeup of the nominating committee, how mm. is the nominating yep. committee chosen. This is all within Beijing's capacity mm. to do in consultation with the Hong Kong government and in consultation with the Hong Kong government that is believed to be representing in part Hong mm -hmm. Kong's interests. And I think one mm. of the tensions we have now is that many people in Hong Kong do not believe that the Hong Kong government is representing the interests of Hong Kong as well as it, as well as it might. Yeah. But the question then beyond that would be, it would take a confident, and, and uh, perhaps uh, President Xi is that confident leader, to take that step. Right now, one could argue just as well, it seems a matter of potential insecurity not to allow uh, Hong Kong to have the level of choice uh, have a uh, reasonably democratically selected nominating mm -hmm. committee yeah. uh, uh, to, 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 to go on to the next steps. We shall see. I don't yeah, a president might take that step, a general secretary might not. I, I want to open it up to, to questions, but just before that, I have one last question for CM, where we're talking about these different interpretations. We talked about culture. Is there also an issue here that there's different understandings in Beijing and Hong Kong about what law means and the rule of law? And when we have had just had the fourth plenum, 
uh, of the uh, Central Committee in Beijing, which was dedicated to rule of law, yep. doesn't look an awful lot like the way that maybe the lawyer society might understand law in Hong Kong. Is this also an issue? Um, I, I think the basic law we talk about the Constitution is a very broad brush approach. You know, you talk about general things. So basically, leave it to local legislation to actually talk about the actual how to implement all these steps. But coming back to the point, I, th I think you're absolutely right. There's actually a very bad expectation management there. Mm. If in Beijing's eyes, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, the Joint Declaration and the Basic Law always said that the central government has the ultimate authority to appoint the chief executive. If this is the message, why is it not pass it through, you know, after handover 17 years. Yeah. You know, the expectation management, I think it, it's, it's, it's bad, you know. And also uh, about Occupy Ch uh, Central, you know, this movement actually was uh, first uh, uh, raised two years ago. And the Hong Kong government still handle it quite badly, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, they fired 87 uh, uh, the tear gas canister on, on the first day uh, to, uh, and, and label all these students as rioters, you know. Uh, again, you know, the, the, the implementation on the whole Hong Kong government side, the expectation management from the central government side could be improved, definitely. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't be come to this, uh, th th this stage. Thanks very much. I'd like to open it up now uh, to the floor. Um, as usual, uh, we have the normal rules uh, for a forum session. First of all, I would ask those of you who are asking questions, please, uh, to identify yourselves. Let us know who you are. And uh, we would like uh, one brief question per person. This is not particularly a place to start with speeches. And also remember that questions do end with a question mark. They don't end with a statement. And last, let me just also add in, if there is one particular person you would like to address your question to, please let us know who that is. We have four stationary mics here, two down here, two up above, and please line up uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask. Please, let's start here. Uh, Jane Mansbridge, I'm a faculty member here at the Kennedy School. Um, can any, and this is addressed to all four of you, can any of you think of a composition of the nominating committee that would be um, acceptable both to Beijing and to the students? I assume not, but, but, but possibly. I mean, then that's what I'm, I'm asking you to exercise your imagination. And then the sort of second question is if there is no such uh, beast available, um, what do you think, what are the possible outcomes to the present uh, protest? Thank you. I mean, I think that there probably is actually a composition of the committee that would be acceptable to all parties. A lot then depends on uh, Beijing's wisdom and going back to Bill's point, you know, would uh, General Secretary Xi uh, be willing uh, to, to allow that? Could you specify um, yeah, the kind of we'll, we'll come, I'll leave that difficult bit to my panelists. <laughs> because I think whatever the composition is, whoever's gonna come out elected in this is still gonna be favorable to Beijing. So I think they can give in the nominating committee to allow more people from different sectors of society, from labor groups and student groups to come into the nominating committee. I think there can even be candidates nominated who are in the democratic camp. I think that would be perfectly acceptable, not beyond the realm of reason, and uh, I still think Beijing would come out on top of that, but other colleagues I'm sure might have Heather or uh, CM. I mean, so I think a little bit of context. The current nominating committee, like the body that votes for the chief executive, consists of 1,200 people. They are selected from like four large sectors of society. The problem is they're not very representative of members of society. So I can't remember the titles of all four of them, but they're like professionals, um, like real estate. Um, but one of them is literally labor, social service, and religion. And that means basically everyone else in Hong Kong. So you have three of the sectors represent. No plumbers. Yeah, no plumbers, <laughs> no <laughs> Polish plumbers. Um, so you have three sectors that represent you know, the elite, and you have one quarter that represents everyone else in Hong Kong. Now, obviously, there's a lot of finesse to where exactly China and the Hong Kong protesters would agree. But even if they took that quarter bracket and they expanded it, con like even not even slightly more considerably than it is now, even that would be so much better than the current system that's in place. Mm. I'm just do you saying think something like that would be acceptable to the students? 
Sorry. I would say yeah, that what well, is... Let, let, sorry, let Heather just... Yeah, um, please. On that, Why don't you, please. Would that oh, no. be acceptable to students? Um, like I said, I think most people who are part of the democracy movement would appreciate any concession. I think, again, like that concession would mean a lot more to the students than it would mean to the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government. But of course, like I said, the democracy movement is really disparate, so it would please some, but not all. Sorry to cut you off, Bill. No, not at all. I, I would just say that it's from a distance, and of course we are looking at this from a great distance here. Uh, it ought to be, in my view, in Beijing's interest to make, ensure that the next chief executive have a strong political base. Mm. And this is one way to have it, to have a, a, a nominating committee that has political legitimacy. Uh, so what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> the most difficult question lands on my lap. Um, I, 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 to be honest, I, I'm quite pessimistic, to be honest, um, to find a solution which is uh, acceptable to the students and also Beijing, very difficult. Um, basically, the students are saying that Okay, if there is a nominating committee, it should be directly elected. Everybody can vote for that. For now, like uh, Heather said, the nominating committee will be voted by uh, roughly about 200,000 people from Hong Kong, 7 million. So it's really, really a narrowly elected committee. Um, uh, to be honest, seriously, I don't see any compromise on this particular point. But my personal aim is make this nominating committee as representative as possible. That's all I can say, and try to convince Beijing. So, see, my, one question. When you say 200,000 will vote for the nominating committee, is that, though, still divided into their sectoral elements? So only X number vote for uh, the professionals. So it's still... It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Heather said, it's actually four different sectors. Right, right. Uh, for example, the lawyers, you know, all the qualified lawyers are mm -hmm. entitled to vote. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for, for representative into the nominating committee, mm -hmm. but not the law clerks, not the trainee, not the you know you know other staff at the law firms. So you know another so way is an actually elitist conception exactly, of democracy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We're yeah. very very colonial, in fact, um, yeah. the arrangement. Right. Yeah. What do you think will happen? <laughs> I will speak as a historian, and uh, we have we're very good at predicting the past. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is Steve Carey, and I'm a teacher with the Boston Public Schools. Um, I have uh, recently heard an idea, a tactical idea, and it involves culture, and I'd like to get your opinion. It's a tactical idea for... Go. Oh. Uh, is there a switch? Yeah, you're still okay. Okay, yep. very good. Yes, um, the movement in Hong Kong is largely young people, and it seems to me that they need an ally, or it seems to many of us, that they need an ally in the mainland, and what better ally than young people on the mainland? So uh, my question is about music. Music is uh, part of the movement in Hong Kong, and I know that some of us know that there are musical bands, rebellious groups, Western-oriented sort of hairstyles, and talking about uh, uh, their own situation, their own feeling of rebellion. I wonder if there could be an alliance or a movement between musical groups in uh, Hong Kong and the mainland, particularly a bicultural musical movement, uh, Cantonese Mandarin. I wanted to get your idea or your opinion about the feasibility of this cultural development, a conscious effort to develop uh, a youth movement that uh, uh, causes an alliance or develops an alliance between the two parts of China and uh, I just want to mention, it seems that movement between the mainland and Hong Kong is so free that any attempt uh, for the Hong Kong, uh, for the uh, mainland authorities to, to censor uh, musical groups going back and forth and being popular in both languages uh, in both Hong Kong and the mainland would, would be somewhat futile. So my question is, uh, how possible is this uh, sort of cultural tactical idea? And um, do you think it might happen? We look at you, Heather. You're the young yeah, you're, one. You're, we're, we're your all generation. <laughs> um, unfortunately, despite being the young one, I'm, I'm a pretty pessimistic Hong Konger. I think most Hong Kongers are pretty pessimistic about what, what's going to happen in the future. I think my answer would be the problem is Hong Kong people and mainland people my age don't necessarily see eye to eye with each other or within the groups. And also, Hong Kong and mainland celebrities don't necessarily see eye to eye with each other or within their groups. You know, Jackie Chan was our tourist ambassador for years, and he hates democracy. Oh man, you do not want to hear Jackie Chan talk about the Hong Kong democracy movement. He's an angry person. But, and I think it's the same with, you know, one of my closest friends at Harvard 
is from the mainland, and we are on completely opposite sides of the spectrum. And we had a huge fight about this recently as well, and I know we'll, we'll be fine, um, but it's, it, it is one of those really divisive issues that you know, I think every person our age in Hong Kong feels, um, and I, it's again the same with the celebrities too. I think the state media of China actually just called on the government to sanction every single Hong Kong celebrity, which includes a lot of singers, that said that gave support to the democracy movement too. So it's a, mm. it's a very combative issue. Yeah, it's not that easy actually to move between Hong Kong and the mainland. And I mean, I think the problem with it in the specific context of what is happening in Hong Kong at the moment would probably be inflammatory because as Heather said earlier, this is not an anti-mainland movement. And I think something that tried to build that kind of bridge around the specific issue in Hong Kong would be interpreted uh, by Beijing as being somehow um, anti-Beijing, uh, and I think that would be very problematic. I do think there is a role, however, for you know, more cultural interaction to try and improve understanding, and of course youth is a good place to start. As you said, there's a lot of garage bands and there's a lot of underground music scene and other things going on in Beijing, but I think if it was seen as a conscious effort, I think it would be very problematic for those that, that might be involved. Uh, yes, the gentleman here. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. My name is uh, Mansoor. I'm a first year at the Harvard Business School. Uh, my question is to all of you. Um, was there a way to express these frustrations, as, as Heather, you mentioned, without blocking the main um, thoroughfares in Hong Kong, without jeopardizing? I mean, there was an impact on the Hong Kong stock market. There's broader impacts than politics. Um, was there a way of doing this without uh, having uh, those negative impacts or jeopardizing Hong Kong's future as a financial center? Great. See you. Um, the, I, I mentioned that the, the Bar Association actually issued a statement saying that you know, they don't agree with the, uh, the, the diso disobeying the injunction. Um, that was a very, very good quote, I think, if I can remember it broadly, uh, by Sir Isaac uh, Ber uh, Berlin. Um, eggs are broken. Omelette is not in sight. <laughs> There are infinite, there are the infinite number of eggs, and the uh, enthusiastic, passionate liberalists forget about the omelette, and eggs are continuing to be broken. So I mentioned about the rule of law and the, the cornerstone of, of Hong Kong. You know, that's, that's really what we have. You mentioned the economy is now being affected. I don't know whether you heard that there was a landmark proposal about the link between the Shanghai stock market and the Hong Kong stock market. A very, very historic um, arrangement, allowing foreigners to go through Hong Kong to invest into Shanghai stocks and vice versa. So Chinese money, renminbi, can come out to Hong Kong into, into international. That scheme is now postponed indefinitely because of, well, allegedly because of the uh, occupied movement. So yes, a lot of people are being affected, local people, business, rule of law, everything being, uh, being, being encroached on. So, is there any way that we can you know, leave everything intact and still continue to move on? Yes, they move to a garden, a park, occupy the garden instead of occupying the main road. That's, that's one way. But you know, these are very, very uh, you know, enthusiastic students and, and people don't seem to be able to convince them. And in fact, it's led by a 17-year-old high school student. So you know, I, I don't have an answer for you, so how to persuade them. So we have a few other people waiting. Gentlemen here. Hello, my name is Raisal Martinez and I'm an engineer in Boston. And in 2047, Hong Kong governance will go to China in the mainland. So it's interesting, I don't understand why, what the end game is for any protesters who want democracy. Because in 2047, it will go back to China. So I'm so confused. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's not an easy topic. No. Bill, do you have any thoughts on that? I think the, uh, what you're referring to is that China guaranteed Hong Kong this high degree of autonomy for 50 years. Yeah. It didn't say that in the 51st year uh, you would be under uh, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay. Uh, who knows what will be ruling China in 2047. That was no, certainly not, uh, but, but it did not, anticipate a diminution of Hong Kong's autonomy. It guaranteed it 
for at least that period right. of time. Is that not Correct. accurate? So, uh, so I don't think that, that, that Hong Kong falls off a political cliff automatically in, in 2047. Yes, it's you. So the issue with 2047 is it's, a, it's kind of a scary date. Um, I think a lot of Hong Kongers with 2047 on their mind every time a big issue like this comes up. That being said, um, from my personal experience and just from the work that I've done on China research, so I am not an expert, but this is what I know. Hong Kong actually is really strategic for China to have in the SAR position that it is. So Hong Kong's actually one of the biggest re-exporters in the world. Um, Japan is actually China's, like one of China's largest trading partners and almost all its trade goes through Hong Kong for political <coughs> reasons and such. Um, Hong Kong is really strategic for China for many reasons, whether it's the fact that the entire city speaks amazing English, that there's also the man, that people are learning a lot of Mandarin, it's an economically strong financial center of the world. There are a lot of reasons for China to like have Hong Kong and continue to have Hong Kong in their strategic position as it does. And I think as Professor Kirby says, the 2047 date is a question mark. No one really knows what's gonna happen, so fingers crossed. So I, yeah, I think uh, you know, one, if I was in Hong Kong, I would want to extract as much as I could now and get it solidified before 2047 came about because whether the Communist Party is in power or not, you know, if certain things are not agreed by 2047, you know, Beijing might just say, well, it's going to be X now, and this is what we're deciding. So I think that makes these things acute, that you want to get these things fixed now so that there's not a debate around it in 2047. So you're being really confronted with a fait accompli uh, by that time. Bill? Yeah, Tony, one, one thing that strikes me is looking back on this, that many of the dire predictions of the loss of Hong Kong's autonomy or the political influence of the Chinese Communist Party in Hong Kong that were there in 19, before 1997 mm. when so many of Hong Kong's elite went to Vancouver and elsewhere uh, to hedge their bets. These things have not happened. Yeah. And this is what makes this crisis in some ways, given the history of the years up till three to four years ago, actually so seemingly unnecessary, mm -hmm. and yet necessary in part because of the promise made for what would happen, not in 2047, but in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, universal suffrage has a certain ring to it, and it usually doesn't mean in other parts of the world um, a selection process such mm -hmm. as that, which is envisaged, in fact, in the basic mm -hmm. law. No, I think that's a very important point to underscore, that a lot of the sirens of doom <coughs> have not come to fruition since 1997. I mean, a lot in Hong Kong has carried on similarly. Sorry, Stephen, we've got, we've got some other short questions. The gentleman here. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Dodan Chen, Chen, and I'm a graduate student at MIT, so I'm an engineer. So I would just like to um, ask about the uh, law and uh, historical context of like a civil disobedience campaign because this is uh, addressed as such. It's, it's named Umbrella Evolu uh, Revolution, but it's not exactly a revolution because I spent like my uh, elementary and high school days in Hong Kong, so 18 years, like you can imagine. So I, we are the, in the generation who cares much about Hong Kong and really wants to know how it will affect like the future of the city. So uh, as Mr. Chen also mentioned, like so, um, how how was like how is this civil disobedient campaign like affecting our current um, justice system? Because like many civil disobedient campaigns, like Gandhi and like um, Martin Luther, like when they did that, they they also did broke some laws. I, I would imagine based on my my understanding. So what is the point of like having in in the disobedient campaigns? What is the line that you? you can cross some boundaries into like disobeying some laws or, or just like if it's entirely lawful then it will not be a disobedient campaign, right? So it's just my question and also as a professor is a historian, I would just like to also like to understand how most of these campaigns end up historically, like some are success, some were successful, some were not. Like is there any similarities um, with the current movement that or any trends that is heading towards which way that might, uh, obviously a one country, two system is a new concept in the world. So it's not like, um, and, and we are actually a city under the country of China. So it's not um, an entire independent uh, government. So, so I don't know how this will play into the role of everything. So I just want to uh, ask this question yeah. to both, both 
Thank you. Sim, uh, thank, 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 thank you for the question. Um, the first one about uh, the term of this uh, movement, revolution, is an unfortunate term. Uh, I think it's uh, not helpful at all because uh, uh, we mentioned about the information flow between Hong Kong and Beijing government. If you mention revolution, you know, the immediate reaction will be we need to suppress it. Yes, yes. But in fact, it's not a revolution, it's a movement. Um, your second question about uh, civil disobedience, yes, the Hong Kong students are also inspired by Gandhi and Dr. Uh, King. Um, personally, I see some differences between uh, those movements and the uh, umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Uh, first of all, uh, from Gandhi's point of view, civil disobedience, there must be some sort of self-sacrifice. Number two, there should be non-violent. Number three, of course, you, know, you have to break some law. However, the law that you're breaking must be a, an evil law, which is so unfair, so unjust. However, in Hong Kong, the law they're breaking is actually to do with public space. It's, itself is not nothing wrong with the law. So you're breaking that, but you're trying to use that as your leverage against something else. So that's one difference. The second difference is more and more I see more violent acts act recently. That's really worrying. So, uh, and, and the police will have to react. And I remember there was a, a video uh, clip went uh, viral on the internet that three uh, police officers were surrounded by about 200 students. And they were really constrained themselves, not pulling out their guns. So I was really, really worried about those scenes. So personally, I think the, the, the normal civil disobedience movement is slightly different from what we're talking here. Right. Um, I just have a follow up uh, real quick. Um, so just say, may, maybe come back to that because there's a couple of other. Okay. If there's time afterwards, so Tony, can we just could, answer the, yeah, the yeah, please. question on the? Actually, one quick question: Are engineers a functional constituency? <laughs> yes, they are. They so are, you get the vote. Actually, yes. <laughs> so you have democracy. Um, the, you know, if you think of how this looks historically, uh, in compare, there's, there's no easy answer in, in the realm of Chinese history. But if you, it's really a 19th century political structure of a sort that we have in Hong Kong today. Uh, reminds me a little bit of uh, certain principalities uh, in the Holy Roman Empire uh, or in, in the German Bund uh, before 1848 of a, a partially elected uh, city council or legislature, uh, a permanent bureaucracy, uh, a designated prince, often hereditary or nominated by uh, on high, and a potentially repressive military. Uh, it, it's a recipe not for happiness. Right. Um, yeah. And I suppose, see, I mean, one of the problems related to this question is if, if the movement did go to a park, they really would lose their leverage. I mean, people are having to listen, having to talk to True. them because of the disruption True. they're causing. True. There's a gentleman here. Hi, my name is TJ Wong. I'm a visiting professor at uh, Harvard Business School. I'm from Hong Kong, uh, but I've been away for a few months because of the visit. Um, I'm much more concerned not about economics, it's about the polarization of society. Uh, the young and the established, uh, rich and poor. I'm very alarmed what CY learned, mentioned about those who make less yeah. than 14,000 is not supposed to vote. So my question is, from your perspectives, how can we heal this city that is sick right now? And the key is how do we build trust among people, people groups, especially from the local government to the central government. And I, I'm very concerned about it. Yeah, thank you. Heather, would you like to start with that? So from my personal experience, uh, three topics of conversation constantly come up um, at every dinner table. One is trust with the government. The, the second is socioeconomic inequality. And third is social mobility. And these three things have definitely just gone downhill from the handover till now. You know, people in Hong Kong, they see on television that both candidates for chief executive um, in the last election are both under investigation for constructing illegal, uh, doing illegal constructions to their house. Uh, the former chief secretary is currently um, facing a trial for corruption. And there's another member of the government who just got sued by a high school student for defamation and facing five other, you know, corruption charges. So people see this on television and there's no trust with the government anymore, especially when you see this on television and you have to pay incredibly high rent when there's very little social mobility in Hong Kong. In the, in the South China Morning Post yesterday, there was an article about how a 99-year-old woman had to collect cardboard boxes every day because she couldn't afford her rent. That is a daily occurrence for most Hong Kong people. That's how a lot of Hong Kong people live their lives. So when CY Lung in the midst of all of this says, 
we can't have democracy because poor people would get undue influence, that hurts. That hurts personally. Um, that's a lot of trust that has already been eroded through the years, and that's just like a scissor kick to the gut for most Hong Kong people. Yeah. Sian, do you? Um, no, I, I think Heather, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the, 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 it, it's all, all about economy. Um, uh, the housing prices have been skyrocketing, skyrocketing in the past few years, partially um, because of the mainland Chinese investors as well. It doesn't help, you know, really because of the, uh, the, 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 the inequality. Uh, CY Leung, the chief executive, did try very hard to find land to build more public housing, for example. But Hong Kong has this unique problem. It's, Hong Kong is a very, very small city. Uh, it's about uh, 10 times of Washington. I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's about 1,000 square kilometers. It's very, very small and very mountainous. So difficult to find flat land to build housing. So CY Leung realized the problem, but there's simply no quick solution um, mm -hmm. to this. One of the things that worries me is um, you know, one of the long-term legacies of this after the demonstrations may have finished is uh, this question of lack of trust. And if you really have a younger generation who is not confident anymore about, you know, let alone 2047, 2017, and given that uh, Hong Kong is such a cosmopolitan, vibrant, connected environment, will young people start moving? I mean, well, they just decide to call it quits and go somewhere else, which could be a very uh, dangerous uh, trend. Um, I, the inequality, I'd really like to see data around this, because, you know, I first went to Hong Kong, I guess, in the early 70s, and it, would, it seemed to me appalling, <laughs> the inequalities that were there, and the, you know, the dwellers on the boats and so on and so forth. But uh, it's clearly now coming up as an issue and a highlighted issue Partly perhaps legitimized because this is what Beijing talks about a lot of the times, inequality and instability. Sorry, Bill. Did no, you no, I think two points, really. I was struck in the years before 1997 the degree to which some uh, very successful business people in Hong Kong had what I would think in a, in a European context, very 19th century mm -hmm. attitudes. They had done well, and they had done well, often from the bottom up. Uh, and I remember one telling me, uh, and so they didn't really care, mm. to put it bluntly, uh, about others. They could make their own way up. And one, I remember one person uh, telling me, happily someone who has no connection to Harvard whatsoever, uh, uh, but with another famous university, telling me uh, that he was going to leave Hong Kong in 1997 because the communists would take over. Yeah. <laughs> and by the communists, he did not mean the Chinese Communist Party, he meant the Democrats who would <laughs> redistribute wealth. Uh, this, of course, did not happen. If we think of how things can get better and how things can be soothed, I, I do think <clears throat> there is a role to be played by universities. I know that the university mm. presidents of Hong Kong's eight public universities have taken on a role of trying to mediate or at least work with both the yeah. students and the government. They're well trusted. They're they're, they're they have positions of prestige, and the universities themselves are extraordinary. Uh, uh, means of social mobility in contemporary Hong Kong. I can't think of another institution, however, uh, that mm. has that capacity at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we're getting close on time. What I would ask is, instead of eventually calling for a last question, if all four of you promise to be quick, ask your questions one after the other, and I'll ask the panelists to roll their answers in one go. So, you're first. Quick question. Please, tell us who you are, okay. ask quick. And then, yeah, yeah uh, my name is Valerie, and I also come from Harvard College. I just stand here, kind of represent the voice from mainland, because of all the people here actually ask you questions from the United States or from Hong Kong. So, um, so actually, I just read a lot of like published comes from mainland China in Chinese, and it seems like China, Beijing government is quite um, resolute and determined, and it doesn't seem like they will change about their mind, but they're willing to communicate. And also in our main idea, um, there's two things that I want to highlight here. The first um, is a lot of young generation and also people think that definitely like Hong Kong is suffering from the economics, but uh, because uh, actually uh, also because of the mainland um, visit, uh, visitors and also the um, capitals that kind of uh, to revivit the economic in Hong Kong. So they have a lot of visitors, they have demand comes up. And the second thing is there also someone comes up that um, talk about 
um, uh, like democracy have their own understanding in different places. It doesn't mean it's like the democracy from Britain mm -hmm. um, that established you know, hundreds ago in Hong Kong is the best way to go, especially under the current situation that um, China and I mean, Leyland and um, Hong Kong will definitely be together for the future. So, um, so I just want to have, uh, ask about what about your opinion face the kind of ultimate goal, like the end is fixed in that way but the situation is like here, and would that be like, the, will, and also re, uh, related to um, my, uh, some uh, impressions, think about Tiananmen incidents that happened so long times ago, um, so. Okay, I think we've got it, and we're really getting short on time. Thank you. Gentleman here. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Hoi, I'm a uh, first year MPP here at the Kennedy School. My question is for Mr. Chan, you brought up that the Bar Association was not happy that the students ignored the injunction and thus that's eroding the rule of law in Hong Kong. I wonder what you think about the other part of rule of law, which is the independent judiciary, um, the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press that the people of Hong Kong have enjoyed for years. If the students don't continue their civil disobedience and ignore the injunction, do you think that that part of the rule of law would also then erode because the Chinese and the Communist Party are gonna continue interpreting laws for the people of Hong Kong? and thus the independent judiciary losing its power. Great, thank you. A gentleman here. Um, my name is Vince, I'm a first year at the college. Uh, my question is, if the, are there some things the protesters that could be, are there some things the protesters could be doing that they're not doing now that would further their goals? Excellent. And the gentleman here. Uh, Fred Hapke, I'm entirely unaffiliated. Um, my question is, what is restraining the hands? What considerations are restraining the hands of the people in Beijing? What good reasons are there not to have a Tiananmen Square rebuilt? Great, an excellent set of questions. So let's wrap it into final comments from the panelists. Let's start with CM. Um, just to answer the rule of law point, um, I think, yes, we all agree that uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly in Hong Kong is extremely important. And I, I have no doubts the Bar Association will come up again if these rights are being affected in any way. On the uh, Tiananmen question, I think the Tiananmen incident as viewed in Hong Kong and around the world did so much to discredit the leadership uh, in Beijing uh, that it has cast a heavy shadow uh, over uh, Hong Kong and mainland relations since then. I would, however, say that I am very, in the long run, optimistic about Hong Kong's future. Uh, watching what has happened from 1997 until today, if there is really far-sighted leadership in Beijing and real statesmanship to be found there and far-sighted leadership in Hong Kong in multiple sectors, this great city will continue to flourish as part of greater China but with even greater autonomy. A lot of ifs, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Heather? Um, so I guess I would conclude my thoughts with a pessimistic and optimistic note. Um, pessimistic note, honestly, Right now, it doesn't look like China will budge on anything. It doesn't look like they would want to give any concessions to anyone, and that's really unfortunate. Um, if there's anything that the protests have shown, that Hong Kong people, whether you're a lawyer studying at Harvard Kennedy School, you're a protester on the street of Admiralty, like on the front lines, everyone really believes that you know there is a better future for Hong Kong, and everyone's willing to fight for it, even though there is no end goal in sight. And even if they know that the Chinese government won't give in, it's the right thing to do. And I think that's really indicative of how strongly Hong Kong people believe in the future of our city. On the optimistic note, there is a very big differential between the way the young people think about the future and the older people think about the future. The overwhelming number of young Hong Kong people believe in democracy for Hong Kong. So times will change as the years will roll on because sooner or later, those younger people will be the majority voice in Hong Kong. And when that day comes, you will have a chief executive that will have the political and authoritative backing to maybe take a stand on this issue. So yeah, it's, a, it's pessimistic for now, but it's optimistic in a couple years. Yeah, I suppose optimism is my generation will die. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, no, I mean, I think, you know, Hong Kong does have tremendous resilience, as Bill said. I just wanted to make a comment to this lady's question here, because I think it's important, and I think it's the source of a lot of misunderstanding, that there is one model of democracy. And that somehow, if we're talking about this, whether it's on the mainland, whether it's in Hong Kong, it should look like British democracy or it should look like American democracy. All democracies are influenced by their own cultures and their own histories. You know, Japan is a democracy, but it's still very much Japan. 
My country, England, you know, we have a queen as the head of state. It's not an entirely democratic institution. You know, French has a certain strength in the presidency because of its historical uh, development. So I think as, you know, we think about these issues in different contexts, we need to be very mindful about how history, institutions, and culture shape democratic outcomes. So I think even on the mainland, you know, mainland will move eventually to some kind of more democratic accountability. Now how that goes, we have no idea. But it will take into account a lot of its historical uh, preferences, notions of relationships between individuals to the state. Again, that varies hugely. I mean, I come from the UK. We have a very different view about what the state can and should do for you than people in America, for example. So I think these are important issues that, that will be influenced. And uh, on this gentleman's question, I agree entirely uh, with Bill that you know, the last thing uh, Beijing wants is the bad press of an engagement in Hong Kong. I think that in many ways would be suicidal for it. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I think you know, their attitude, even though, as I said earlier, I think they've been poorly informed, is that uh, they can wait this out, certain concessions can be made, and then leave the problem to the next generation of leaders. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening and the questions you raised, and join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Heather.